So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome everyone who is sitting on our panel today. So uh, we have Stuart Brown, Director of MoMart in London, Uwe Gross, Manager of Global Sales and Network Services at Hasenkamp Luxembourg, Deirdre O'Connell, the Director of Exhibitions at Deedle International, Vincent Lombardo, Director of Security and Supervision at Deedle International, Jared Muscato, Florida Regional and VIP Client Manager, that's a mouthful, uh, and myself, Jason Lash, I'm the Director of Business Development for uh, Deedle International. Um, we have Q&A open, so as this goes forward, uh, if you have questions, type it into the question uh, Q&A at the bottom, and we will get to those as uh, we process the information. I would also ask that everyone contain the questions as, as uh, much as possible to supervision. So uh, going forward, let's start a little uh, PowerPoint presentation so that everyone can see what we're talking about. Supervision, reviewing the basics in a post-COVID-19 discussion. What is supervision? Prevent mishandling of shipments, the over, overseas safe pallet and buildup and breakdown, witness pallet loading onto aircraft, ensure shipment is, isn't bumped from scheduled flights and provide courier assistance. Basically, this is gonna be the basics to get everybody up on speed and we're gonna to try to get through this in 15 to 20 minutes and then have the actual discussion about post COVID-19. So Vinny, do you want to uh, start us off and how does supervision happen? Sure. Uh, so the pretty basic steps of supervision. Um, first, the uh, agent is always on site from the second that the truck arrives at the cargo facility. Um, we'll supervise the offload, of course, and the safe storage. Um, we will remain with the shipment up until palletization is complete. Um, then we will obviously follow it to the aircraft, watch it get on the plane, um, supervise up until wheels up. All the while, you're getting real-time updates. Um, if there are couriers involved, there's a few extra steps. Obviously, we're coordinating the transportation, um, hotel stays if needed, um, access to the warehouse, um, any kind of uh, tickets they need to get on the airplane if it's a, if it's a freighter. Um, those are pretty much the basic steps, and vice versa would be for the import as well. Uh, obviously, if coming off the plane, we'll follow you to the cargo facility, watch it get broken down, watch it get loaded onto the truck. And then once the truck departs, um, either we're following it or not, that's uh, obviously predetermined. So and then Stuart and Uwe, those standards hold true for London and uh, Germany as well. Absolutely. And also for the Benelux airport, so there's absolutely no difference. So that is the, that is the, the standard operation we are all following on, yeah. Okay. So I agree. I mean, across London, across the world, the, the standards have been uh, standards have been adhered to across the world for many years. I think they stick. Okay, moving on to Jared. Do you want to discuss the types of air freight? Uh, yeah, of course. So you know, depending on your outing, on on the size of the shipment, there are several different types of aircraft and and whatnot equipment available. Um, probably the most widely known and, and the ones that we all take when we're traveling um, for pleasure would be passenger aircraft. Now there is a difference. There's wide body, there's narrow body. Um, in terms of cargo and, and supervised shipments, you want to stick away from narrow body aircrafts. They do not carry palletized freight. Um, so wide body aircraft, uh, the max height is 63 inches or 160 centimeters. Um, if you're shipping into or out of the U.S., there are certain TSA requirements you have to meet in order to be considered for those types of aircraft. Um, and then the the larger types, um, which uh, you know fly on less direct routings, would be the the freighter aircraft. Um, Jason, if you could advance to the next slide. Yeah, I will. So freighter aircrafts, they, they run on less direct routings. Um, you know, they mainly go between major cargo hubs such as JFK, Luxembourg, um, Brussels, Liège, and whatnot. Um, these do carry only palletized cargo. Uh, they have a max height of around 118 inches, which is 299 centimeters. It is important to note, though, not every freighter is the same size. 
Um, the max height it really is 118 inches, but those are on the larger aircraft only. Some freighters have a much smaller height restriction. Um, and again, because these do not fly direct, you know, the, uh, the, the options are, are less for these than they are with, with the direct passenger flights. It's probably also important to note on there too that the total height includes the height of the pallet and the crate itself, correct? Exactly, yeah. And those pallets, I mean, depending on the type of equipment being used, but they're generally um, one to two inches, but you have to account for the cargo netting and, and whatnot that goes on, on top. You also have to account for the concave shape of the aircraft. The 118 will just be the center line. Um, so depending on the width of what you're shipping, you know, it, it may not adhere to the, the concavity of, of the plane. Um, I pulled up the slide with pallets and containers, Jared. Do you want to talk a bit about the uh, containers as well? Yeah, of course. So on the left-hand side, you'll see um, just basic pallets. You know, they're also called cookie sheets or something like that. They're basically just a, a piece of metal that the cargo gets placed on. Um, and then it gets, it gets strapped down with nets, with plastic. Um, so it becomes a secure, like, single piece that can then be moved to and from the aircraft. Um, likewise, you have the container shown on the right-hand side. These are more for um, the lower deck bellies of the plane, which is what passenger flights would accommodate or what the lower deck of a freighter would accommodate. Um, and they're already, you know, they're built to fit right into those planes like a glove. And if you have smaller crates like are shown here, um, you can place them inside that can be strapped down and secured. And then that whole container is moved as a unit to and from the aircraft. Okay. And now we're going to move on to why is supervision important? So this will lead us partially into uh, standards for supervision at the airlines, but it's also going to be a discussion about some of the post COVID stuff as well. So Deirdre, do you want to talk a bit about why supervision is important? Um, yeah, I will. Um, it, supervision is important for all types, uh, you know, very different types of shipments. We have a range of clients that we were all work with, um, uh, in the US and around the world, and um, they deploy supervision services to greater or lesser degrees according to their needs. Um, there's everything from commercial and gallery shipments through art fair, museum shipments um, with some museum shipments um, without couriers and, and very often with couriers. Uh, there, are, there are shipments that travel every day or have traveled every day up until very recently, many shipments that travel without the benefit of supervision. Um, and that's a choice that's made based on uh, client needs and, and requirements. Um, the imperatives are different for every client group. Um, sometimes supervision is, is, um, is used to make sure that a shipment does make it onto the flight and makes it to its deadline, uh, to its destination on a deadline. And likewise for inbound shipments where something might be required urgently for a viewing or a meeting or as um, a condition of a sale. So, um, there are, so there are many other, many reasons why um, supervision is used and why it is why it is important for art fairs um, we are often moving uh, huge quantities of freight that needs to be organized needs to be handled very safely but also needs to be organized in a very particular way um, according to client and um, making sure that all the locations of the freight are, are easily identifiable um, on arrival so that um, everything can go, go on according to, to plan. I have, um, while we're up here too, I put up some examples of uh, why is the supervision important and mishandling. So Vinny, how often do you see things like this on the pallets and in the, in the warehouses when you're actually at, on supervision? You're muted, Vinny. Sorry about that. Um, I mean, it doesn't happen as often as you would think without supervision. It does happen. Sometimes things do show up without straps. Um, sometimes there are DGs on pallets that you, you know shouldn't have been there. But obviously, if there's no supervision, then, you know, it's up to the airline's discretion. They're trying to maximize space. Um, if things are, you could see on that slide, there was a pallet that was 
there, uh, one crate was about 10,000 pounds. The rest of the pallet was really light. So of course, when it was all floated, was they were moving a little quick and the pallet tipped over. Um, belly load happens not as often, um, but it does. And sometimes you're scrambling and looking for a crate. Even if it does show up supervised, um, sometimes you, know, you don't get information from the other side. It might not be supervised coming over, but it's supervised here. But sometimes you don't have that information, you're scrambling. And if it's in the belly, obviously it's hard to find and it's not really ideal. Right. Deirdre, did you have anything else to add about the, the reason supervision is important? Um, or, or for that matter, well, for, or, you know, for museums and for, for many, yeah, um, does someone else want to chip in first? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's every everything we do and we've done down at the airport and the part of the supervision for from us, I think all of us is is mitigating risk, whatever, whatever that may be from the minute it's it's off the truck to the minute it gets back on a truck or off the museum wall till it gets back onto a museum wall. Um, so it's it's being that pair of eyes. It's the relationships we have with the guys in the airline sheds. They understand and have understood for many years what we want and what we expect so the supervision job has become a lot easier over the years but also a lot more complex with the requirements that are needed to make it happen um, but it is it's mitigating the risk um, making sure no damage comes to the artwork yeah. if i can say what vincent just said it's very important to have that supervision um, or in operation on both ends. So what you said before, how often do you see things like this? So on an inbound shipment, for example, where you haven't had um, a supervision set at the export, it's more often that you see things like this. Um, so it really, it's really important to have supervision uh, in place on both ends. It, very often it makes no sense just to have a supervision on the receiving end or having supervision just on the sending end because as soon as you let these workers in the warehouse or the airline do um, without any supervising them, uh, they are, we are in danger that they do what they do. And they do sometimes things like we have seen before on the slide. So it's an important thing that Vincent said, it's important to have supervision set on both ends, receiving and sending one. I, I intended, um, go ahead Deirdre. Can I add something to that? Um, I think that for airport with airport supervision or with traveling shipments going through the airport, that is, it's the one area where um, there is for, you know, for our clients, for museums, for galleries, for everyone who's using our services, um, right through from pickup, crating, packing, um, customs work and everything. It's the one area uh, both, you know, physically where we all have least control over over what is happening and as Stuart says our, our job as um, as agents art handlers supervisors truckers is to mitigate is to mitigate that risk um, and so in particular for museum clients supervision is um, is a big is a, a big issue and is, is hugely important um, all museum shipments are always supervised um, regardless of whether there is a courier or not um, and the courier or cargo attendant is um, is an added layer of um, of care and attention which allows allows the the lender or borrower to exercise um, the greatest amount of um, of control and to be able to make decisions um, on site at the time um, when things are happening if you know there's we are all only allowed into the cargo area of the airlines um kind of as a as a kind of privilege it's not it's not an entitlement um we are not on our own turf um so uh we have to maintain and Stuart pointed out we've all developed um relationships over many years where the airlines do understand what what our what our aims are um, so, 
I want to bring in real quick because you, you mentioned a point and we were going to bring this up in the beginning and I skipped it, but I want to mention what the current state of warehouses is in the US and in Europe right now with Stuart and Uwe. I apologize for interrupting you and I want to get back to that. But no, no, it's okay. It's, it's, it's a good point because I'm, I'm, I'm talking really in our pre, really about our pre-COVID situation and in a more general sense and um, now there are m many other considerations to be to be taken into um, into account. Vinny, so tell us right now where we are, where we stand today. And as a note, this information changes daily, and it changes everywhere daily. So where are we right now, Vinny? Sure. Um, so right now across the country, uh, the consensus is, of course, social distancing and the proper PPE. Um, there are a few airlines like Lufthansa um, they, and Delta, I know, is requiring temperature checks before entering the warehouse. Um, other than that, they really are not limiting. We're still allowed to bring carriers inside. Obviously, some freighters, you're not allowed to fly, but there's nobody really flying right now anyway. Um, but other than that, there's really no limit that we can do besides what we were doing before. Are couriers allowed entry into those facilities? Um, there's a couple places, like in LA, I know um, Lufthansa doesn't want anyone in their warehouse unless you're a badge personnel. Um, I know uh, San Francisco has a couple airlines. It's all, but again, it's airline, it's case to case. It's not like one set rule across the board. I think it's also important to note too that it's per airport and those airports set their own rules in some of those instances as well too, correct? Right, the airport sets their own rules, but some of the airlines may set their own rules as well. Right. So like JFK is mandating that we wear proper PPE and social distancing, but Lufthansa here at JFK is also requiring that you get your temperature check prior to entering the facility. Okay. So, uh, Stuart? How about you guys? Yeah, I mean, uh, Heathrow is operational, has remained operational. The, the cargo side of things was really shrunk down uh, when, when we went into lockdown. Many of the cargo sheds which had handling agents, handling individual airlines, all of those airlines were put under one cargo building. So it made it things incredibly busy down there. Those now, since our lockdown is easing, um, since the beginning of this week, um, those airlines are moving back into their own sheds. So things are getting back to a normality down at Heathrow. The trouble is, it's it's at the moment, it's getting the information. It's it's getting hold of the people to to ask some of the direct questions. They obviously our movements, our fine art movements, aren't top priority on their lists at the moment with everything going on. But those I have managed to speak to, um, like you said about. Um, badging up the, your, the staff, what they're alluding to at the moment is it will only be BAA pass holders and um, British Airways Authority pass holders who can get access within the cargo buildings. Now this is, as you said, it's, it's changing all the time. They're, right, they're having to write the procedures, they're having to write the procedures for PPE and everything else along that. So it's, it'll be a slow process over the next um, week or so before we get real clarity, but we're expecting, and as I say, those we've spoken to, the, our access and our procedures will only change um, with regards to the need of PPE and, and social distancing. I have a question from uh, the audience and it doesn't directly supervision related, but the, the question was what's happening with the channel? We can use the channel. We can get across to Europe. We can get across to Luxembourg and deliver stuff into, into Luxembourg Cargo Lux and onto the age anywhere. So the channel is open. Got you. Uwe. Yeah, if I can mention, uh, so the situation not only per, um, per airport is different, but it's also sometimes different with the, with the handling agent at the airport. For example, in Amsterdam, you have KLM, you have WFS, you have Denata. Um, the same in Frankfurt, you have Lufthansa, then you have all these handling agents at the Cargo City South. So for the moment, we can say, for example, for us in Luxembourg and for Frankfurt, we have full access, so there's no really difference. So the supervision can be done even with third parties right next to us. So if there is a cargo attendant, uh, which is coming landside and wanted to supervise an import or an export shipment, that's still possible as uh, everybody can imagine. So uh, the, 
the, the masks are still uh, a must and uh, you need to keep distancing. But in general, supervision on site with cargo attendants and for our staff as well, it's still the same. In Amsterdam, it's a little different. So I heard that KLM is not accepting supervisions until June 1st, which may be, uh, has something to do with the losing um, restrictions in the Netherlands. Maybe it will change uh, quickly. So this is, you have to keep an eye on that on a daily basis. So at WFS and the NAFTA in Amsterdam, it's different. So WFS is, shouldn't be a problem, the handling agent. And the NAFTA is uh, from time to time different. In the edge, it's still that everything can be done on site. So same as all the years before. But as this COVID now is not only an amendment, it's uh, more or less a game changer for all of us in shipping. So as uh, cargo attendants are no more coming with the plane, but maybe coming landside and just uh, leaving the airport as soon as uh, the job is done. Um, it's, uh, it's still possible to bring people in. That's what I said. It's not necessary to have a, to have a ticket on the flight where the cargo is coming with. Um, which, other, which other airport did I forget one? No, I think Frankfurt is still there. I said that Frankfurt is still the same, Munich is the same as all the years before. It just takes longer and we need to make preparations more early in time because more parties at the airport at the handling are involved. So we need to be sure that the booking itself is a proper one and that uh, our supervisors can do their job um, on a base that would avoid any problems. So. Right. I want to get into that in more detail in just a little bit, but Stuart, uh, and this is going to be the part we're getting a bunch of questions now so I'm going to jump on each one of these questions just to everybody know that you will we will answer these um, Stuart in going forward in COVID-19 you speak to us about the cha changes uh, going forward and the safety of the artwork what well I mean we've 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 alluded to it already that we we mitigate the risk of the artwork and that's everything we do now we we need to add to the top of that mitigating the risk of the the people around the artwork and the people that handle the artwork, whether it's our own staff, whether it's the, the cargo agents. Um, how we do that, I think across the board, um, there's going to have to be better communication, there's going to have to be more flexibility and more trust, um, whether that's trust in other institutions, trust in your know, shipping agents, um, but just those conversations are going to have to be had for for each shipment and we're all looking at procedures and, and processes of how these things are going to be done at the moment and as I say everything comes back to a risk assessment across across the board from our point of view. So I want to get into some of these questions real quick and some of them are basic but other ones are more advanced and, and sort of go deeper into the issues that are, are currently happening. Are couriers currently being allowed on cargo flights? There's a big, everybody's shaking their head no. <laughs> couriers are not currently allowed on cargo flights. Do we know when couriers will be allowed back on cargo flights? I know that'll be the next question. There's no Anybody? definitive answer at this time. Crystal ball, right? Yeah, no airline can tell us. <laughs> yeah, there's, there is, there's there is no clear ball. timeline for couriers being allowed onto cargo flights. Okay. What additional steps might agents offer to museums who decide to forego sending a courier, taking images, text, texting the museum, contacts during palletization? So this is one of the questions that we wanted to actually talk about. I know everybody's panel did. Can uh, somebody address how we might add additional supervision and security to these uh, shipments? I mean, you've, list, you've listed some of the options there. It's it's photography. Photography is an option, but it's also a problem. Within the cargo sheds, we're not authorized to take pictures. We do manage to take pictures, as you know. Um, body cams, they would not be permitted in any way, shape, or form. So I'm just thinking, what more can we do? And it comes back to comes back to the communication and are there other ways of communicating the pallet build, how that's done, how it needs to be done through to the museum directly. And our representatives would be happy to have more communication with 
institutions should it be needed. And I know that he's got some ideas as well down in Luxembourg. Uwe? Yeah, so we have that in, yeah, we have that in use for a couple of years already. We developed our own, uh, for our supervisors, our own supervision app where they, where they can, um, where they see the shipments on their mobile devices. So they are generating immediate supervision reports by uh, from every single step. So for an export shipment from delivery from the truck uh, through the pallet build up all the way up to uh, aircraft loading and departure. So these will be sent by our supervisors that are on stage in real time. Also with photos in Luxembourg, which um, is a little different for our supervisors in Frankfurt. They are not allowed to take photos in the warehouse over there. So in Liège, it's not a problem to get these real-time supervision reports with photos uh, constantly. Yeah, that's what we are doing from our company all these years already. So it's important now to be focused on this real-time reporting. Um, one of the questions, one of the questions to the panelists directly addresses this too, Uwe, and I wanted to bring this into the conversation. With the possible restriction of couriers traveling, will supervisors have more direct communication with clients versus going through representatives? And that's exactly what you're talking about, is uh, having those people on the ground send direct emails to clients. But I think this goes back to also trusting your agents and having your agents have those representatives on site that can send you real-time information. Deirdre, right. do, you, do you want to say anything about that either? Um, or yeah, Jared? that is something, the real-time communication is something that we have been called upon to do in certain situations in the past. Um, obviously, technology now is a little bit more sophisticated and there are easier and better ways of, um, of keeping up communication, but we certainly on, at, on particular shipments have, um, have maintained uh, communication with lenders um, in re in real time during the night at every stage of um, departure arrival um, depalletization on the other side customs clearance etc um, there's also the possibility of employing what has been it's called bookend couriers where you have your courier coming to the airport and that can be your the institutions or the galleries courier um, uh, and they as Uwe said you come and you know go through the processes and then leave leave after that you can also um, I mean you can also have your agent do that um, and it's clear that you do need an extra agent for that because um, there is uh, paperwork to be attended to administration with the airline office um, and whoever is trying to be or acting as the ears and eyes of the um, of the client um, needs to be able to have their full attention and when you say an extra agent you mean an extra person on the ground in the warehouse yes so yeah. this person would be essentially, and Uwe had mentioned this previously in another conversation we had, it's not necessarily called a courier because they're not couriering the freight, but it's a cargo attendant, right? Right. Yeah. yeah, and that cargo attendant can be hired by your agent and be represented from your agent, but they're acting as that supervision who is on the ground, who has direct eyesight on that crate at all times, while your supervisors who are on the ground are handing in paperwork and doing the things necessary to make sure that everything runs smoothly. Right. right. So um, I saw it came up if it's recommended to have supervision in in place by now, even though I'm not, maybe not uh, every museum shipment, but all other final shipments as well. If this is, uh, it's a matter of it was a matter of costs in the past, but I think it's very recommended at the moment because of all the volume of backlog uh, cargo. What's in the uh, in the cargo halls at the moment and on top of that all these uh, essential goods that needs to be sent you're always going in danger that your cargo will be not under control and getting bumped last minute so if you don't have a supervisor on ground at that stage um, you can be fall back so that for supervision in general so if it, if it comes to the cargo attendant it's like I said before so um, 
we did it very we did it for a long time already that uh, we have two supervisors on in duty even for for uh, for smaller shipments because you cannot organize with airline handling agents and these forklift drivers in the warehouse and having the freight all the time under uh, eyewitness let's say like this so I would recommend to have a second person for sure for every shipment. We have two supervisors on duty then. If it comes to the point that we need an additional cargo attendant from whomever um, hired, um, I would. It, it doesn't cause a problem, and this uh, third party is always should always be in the position to transmit real time reporting, but. Um, from my point of view, it's not absolutely necessary that we have these traditional couriers doing all these single step of work out the museum up to the loading of the aircraft by, by just one person. So maybe it, uh, it, it's more the fact that um, these physical work should be done by people and overviewing by people who can react on straight away and um, going in the sense of, uh, of the right. I want to read so, that and I want to read this question and Jared maybe you can answer a matter of trust. Okay. right it's a matter of trust and I want to yeah. read that what you were what you were answering was a question that we had on the the Q&A here and it's it's sort of specific too. it says well we often choose supervision clients are asking if at this time it is still an effective way is is it still effective as a way to to weigh more extreme supervision costs in addition to higher air freight costs? Or is it more recommended that you be given a situation for flights of being overbooked or canceled? Basically, how, do, how are clients supposed to weigh these price points? And anybody jump in on this? Jared, Stuart? Yeah, I'd like to, to jump in on that. Um, so it's, it's a good question. I mean, Uwe was, was alluding to it in, um, in his conversation just a moment ago, but essentially, with the cancellation of, of most passenger flights in and out of the US and, and Europe, you know, there is a huge backlog of cargo. Um, you know, that, that means more cargo than ever is being relegated to the, the, the cargo only flights. And those are, are less frequent and, and further between than your daily passenger flights. I mean, to London, you have multiple airlines uh, typically running multiple flights a day. And that amount of cargo space that, the, that they're handling is, is just less cargo that does not need to be taken up on the on the freighters. So now with, with everything being backlogged, with, with two, two plus months now of freight being backlogged, these airline warehouses are, are full. Um, you know, there's a lot of freight that needs to get moved, not just art, not just PPE, not just, you know, life-saving goods, but I mean, any commodity you can think of. And those warehouses are full and busy warehouses can create the types of issues that supervision, supervision is meant to mitigate. Right? Okay, so we have questions directly related to that, Jared. And one of them is, is there an increased risk to pallets and crates at this time, perhaps due to crowded warehouses, high demand for decreased cargo? The other one is, do we expect to see cargo prices increase in the next several months due to the major financial losses being experienced by airlines right now? So can you, you guys? Yeah, so to, to answer the first part of that, I mean, absolutely. You know, with more freight being in the warehouse, um, you know, the, the airline staff are working harder than ever to get it all taken care of, to get it built up, to get it palletized, to get it out on flights. And, you know, at the same time, these airlines are suffering financial setbacks. Some airlines and, and warehouse staff are, are cutting staff. They're furloughing people. They're laying people off, um, you know, which is just compounding the problem in total um and so i would say like yes supervision is becoming a bit more expensive all these things are taking more time when you take into account the uh the social distancing procedures how everything needs to be more more and cautious. cargo rates are higher now too and and as a result cargo rates are also higher yeah. you know it's a supply and demand question there's there's supply still there i'm sorry the demand is still there but the supply of, of aircraft is not um so those rates have been going up um, you know, when the economy reopens, they will probably remain high for a while to deal with the backlog of freight before we start seeing things begin to normalize. Okay. How long that takes, you know, that's, that's a crystal ball question. And Vinny, this goes directly into those warehouses um, and the being busy inside the warehouses. Vinny, how, are, how, mu 
how much clout do supervisors have to prevent bumping? To be honest, um, not that much. It, it really all depends on how your shipment was booked. You know, if it was a high level um, priority shipment, uh, you know, most of the time we can we can negotiate with them and they'll they'll push our shipments forward because um, they know that we have to get out at this time with all of the, like, the backlog that Jared was saying. It, it, it's really it's hard to to imagine what's going to happen and what they're going to allow us to do and what clout we're going to have. So it's why supervision is even more important at this moment, but also booking at a higher priority rate on those airlines when you're booking. So same with Uwe, go ahead. Yes, so like uh, Vince said, you need to be sure you have the cargo all the time under control and uh, um, it's, um, it should be a must for the supervisors that they have, uh, that the cargo is booked by um, by parties that are in close contact. Um, ideally, it would be the best uh, if the cargo was booked by an agent that is going from that out of that out of the country or that airport to be sure to have it every time under control. Because if it comes to the handling itself, which at freight is almost it's in the, very often is in the middle of the night, then it's uh, not really you're very often stuck to get the right information to the people who were involved in that whole booking to whatever weight, to whatever conditions, can they get stacked, can other um, other goods maybe packed on the crate on the pallet as well. So if that needs to be decided right on spot, it's always good to have uh, to put the supervisor in the position that he's under control of that cargo. Either it's booked by his country company himself or he is he has a POA on hand a proper POA on hand who gives him the, um, the the power to step in and not bumping or not doing crazy things by the airline so uh, that's important to be sure you have the supervisors have the cargo under control one of the one of the conversations we had had pre prior to this webinar getting prepared for this was uh, having more flexibility on how pellets are built for our clients and stuff as well too. And the clients realizing that they need to be a little more flexible on what's allowed. Otherwise they could easily be bumped. Did, does somebody want to discuss that a little bit, Stuart? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was relating to the cost of the air freight as well. That, that whole thing, we all know that many shipments already, um, we have to buy dedicated pallets, dedicated units for those shipments to avoid any unnecessaries going on the pallets. But moreover, in, in the cargo sheds at the moment, or prior to this, our guys had, they have the relationships, they, they were in a position to be able to say to the handling agent, look, this time, don't put that on my pallet, can I keep, can I keep this separate, can I keep that separate? Um, as Vinny said, at the moment, the airlines are trying to maximise and maximise and use all of that space they've got on the aircrafts. So those, those opportunities we had to ask for those favours, ask those questions have gone. This is... Um, this is a good question directly pertaining to that. And I think all of you guys can maybe address this. It says, at this time, you're seeing institutions clients sending couriers to cargo warehouses to witness the consolidation of palletization. Then partner institution clients providing couriers on the other end arrival depalletization. Are you seeing those institutions and clients sending couriers to do that? Not at this time. Not at right. the moment. Yeah. Okay. But it's not unusual. It wasn't unusual in the past. So. Yeah. Uh, let's say like it's not the classical museum uh, cargo attendant shipment as a courier as the all work. just one just one courier but uh, we had these um, described situations in the pre covid time we had this and we could handle that and it should be um, it should be more regular shipment for the future i would say yeah and we need to be flexible that's what uh, vince and stuart said because the airlines, they want to fill up every kind of space they have on that, on that aircraft. So, um, like Stuart said, with exclusive pallets, you might be, might be problematic. What I heard in Frankfurt it was problematic to get exclusive pallets from Lufthansa. Um, so they are focused to get every single pallet packed as, packed as possible. So, and um, yeah, that's, what I mean, so 
you need to be prepared to get more consolidated shipments. Okay. And, so one of the questions we just had now, and there's two questions that directly. Sorry, I want I wanted to speak yeah, that topic too, please. Um, at the moment, there there are um, many loans that are from the U.S. that are out of the country, um, and indeed loans to the to the U.S. as well, um, and they are shipments that travelled out with couriers. Um, and I know that when the museums overseas reopen. Um, I do know of shipments where it is, it's already been decided that uh, a courier won't go to bring that shipment back um, until, you know, th such time as, in, those shipments have to move, but the couriers are not going to, to travel. Well, we've seen, we've seen that before with, with the ash cloud. Yeah. Um, in those circumstances that we'd have these type of bookend couriers either in. Stuart, you still there? Yeah, I've got a problem with my computer, but I'll try. We can still hear you. Okay. Keep talking. Well, no, it's just that we've we faced these situations before, as I say, with the Ash Cloud exhibitions that had 105 couriers coming to London for the inbound. We then dealt, dealt with the dispersal, having something like 50 couriers for the dispersal because no one wanted to travel. Um, but we dealt with it with the institution and with the partners around the world. Okay, so one of the questions, and these are the two questions that directly pertain to this. Can fine art shippers buy a pallet and the flight and then try to uh, fill them with various institutions? Basically consolidating is what you were talking about, Uwe. Yes, correct. Right. So what becomes the prob problematic issues with consolidation on institutions and gallery shipments? Just for, uh, it, as long as it's fine art, I think, uh, I think we, we, we at the airport, our supervisors, they are all pretty familiar how to, how to handle that appropriate. So, and in the end, uh, the supervisors just uh, just looking on a wooden crate. So they have no idea what's in there. Is that a Da Vinci or maybe it's a photo or whatever. So they handle every single fine art shipment the same way. So I don't see a problem to combine or to consolidate um, um, museum shipment with other fine art shipments. So, if that was the question, yeah, there are there are many galleries whose whose standard procedures are are very close to museums' procedures with regard to handling supervision and couriers, um, just because of how high values are um, and so on and so forth. So. Um, yeah, we often we often see consolidated pallets in any case um, on particular flights um, where the and at times of year when there is a lot of traffic. Um, so yeah, it's not. It's but clients are going to have to be more flexible to allow for consolidation with other artworks on these pallets. Is basically yeah. and the information of when these things are shipping and how it's going to ship. Yeah, and I, um, if it. The, the airline or the handling agent is requesting other consolidation for that pad. Uh, this is again a uh, reason to have supervisors on the ground and maybe even the cargo attendant. So there are other goods that are even uh, not bad to put on the pallets, like uh, if you have, um, let's say, garments or something like this, but no machines or. Right. You need to need you need to stop these handling agents then. So consolidation at a certain point it's okay, but uh, at a certain point you have to stop that, and that's also the reason why all these air freight rates are raising. Like you said before, they are rise uh, was right. tremendous rise. Okay, I have another question here. <laughs> Once and this is a, a general question for all of you guys. Once our museums approve their staff to travel again, is having a courier on a flight the best way to ensure the highest priority level of clout and your cargo from not getting bumped? Does having a courier there with a purchase ticket give you any clout inside of that airline to not get your freight bumped? It buys you time on occasions. Um, the fact, certainly if a courier's got a checked in luggage, it'll buy you a bit of time at the aircraft because it's, take that container off or find that passenger's luggage who's got a checked in bag, but that's, that's the only thing it can really do. 
would say for for cargo flights, I mean, maybe, I mean, right now cargo flights aren't allowing couriers or car- cargo attendants, as we mentioned earlier. But if you are flying on a, on, a, on a cargo flight, you know, there are a whole bunch of security procedures you have to go through in advance. Um, and so generally, I would say if, if you're traveling as a courier on a cargo flight, the chances of your shipment getting bumped are are less in that in that sense. Okay. Uh, I want to jump to some of the solutions and everything. So one of these, uh, two of these questions directly relate to couriers on trucks, um, but also I want to talk about follow cars a little bit here. So what is the current state of allowing couriers on trucks? So we haven't had the we haven't had the need to at the uh, at the moment. Just checking. Can you see me? Because I've lost everything on my computer. We cannot see you, but we can hear you. Okay, I'll try. I can back. see. I can see you. Oh well. Anyway, um, <laughs> we 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 won't be. I mean, at the moment, the the government restrictions are to keep social distancing in effect as much as where possible. So with our driver cabs. Um, yes, they're four or five seaters, but we wouldn't be able to adhere to the government guidance properly um, if we were to allow careers you know and we want to protect our we want to protect our drivers um, we're going to be keeping those in teams where possible so to bring in another entity into that vehicle cab at the moment is a is a no but we could certainly for movements down to Heathrow um, follow cars could be an option and things like that but within the vehicle within the truck at the moment it's a no okay and other creative solutions. We are using follow cars here in the U.S. as well, too. So when there is issues with social distancing, I, I believe Uve and Stuart, you guys are using vans, right? So, right. Yeah. so you're, yeah. you're 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 creating a larger space with inside these vehicles, and also there's the possibility of using guards inside of these or uh, uh, barriers inside of the vehicles when necessary as well, too. But Necessarily, yes, can be done. So, but we avoid to have uh, cargo attendants on our trucks. So, just our truck drivers are on there, um, and we are providing them a follow van, like you said, for the courier to have the um, needed distance between the driver and the, and the cargo attendant in the very back. So, that's I think that's the feasible thing, and that's an appropriate and a safe thing. We should go for even if a second person would be allowed. One driver, we wouldn't go that way. So, let's say that. So, so it, as I said, it makes it all more, um, yeah, we, we blow it up a little bit, these cargo attendant shipments, but it's still possible. And I think the major, the major thing is uh, the consolidation for every kind of shipment needs to start from the very beginning. So, the institution underneath, underneath each other need to trust themselves. That uh, that they can be combined and to uh, to reduce uh, these huge amount of shipments that are not possible at the moment. So and I just can can talk from the freighter side. I know that in, on passenger side it was completely different in, in the past, and uh, but I don't see that um, cargo on passenger flight with cargo attendants will return so quickly. So. At the moment, the uh, freighters are the only open option. Um, yeah, and for that, we should, it should be consolidated as much as possible. Okay. A couple other questions here, but also I wanted to mention, that part of this, um, we had also mentioned tracking of, of uh, shipments. You can provide the ability to track shipments. Does somebody want to, Jared, do you want to discuss that a little bit? Sure. Um, so there are some technical options for for tracking shipments. Um, most of these are standalone products um, that we can order. They can be programmed in advance, and essentially they act as um, shock watches, climate climate indicators, temperature gauges, um, and they also do provide a real time tracking fun- function online or through an app um, for the majority of the journey. Um, I, I do believe it's up to 10,000. 10, yeah, feet. I think most operate up to 10,000 feet. So you'll be able to see, you know, when they're taking off, when they're landing. And um, it's, it's a useful feature, especially when done in conjunction with on the ground supervision. Uh, Stuart, one question for you real quick. 
are two yeah. drivers okay in your trucks? Yeah. Okay. So the government and government guidelines are social distancing where possible. So we've, we're, as I said earlier, we're doing our risk assessment. We've done our risk assessments for that side of things based on the government guidelines, um, sanitizing the vehicles, face masks, gloves, um, mask, face, um, mouth masks. So everything we followed all the government guidelines and we can get the two vehicles on the, the two drivers on the vehicles. One of the one of the question and Uve, same with same with your your teams, two drivers. Don't have to add something, so Stuart has it. Okay. The how uh, one of the questions is how are you handling social distancing with art shipments? So this is basically what you were just talking about, Stuart. Uh, I think it's important to note too that when we're doing these, we have to be creative about what we're doing and uh, having a conversation with Fritz Dietl the other day, one of the things we might end up doing or we're going to do is have PPE equipment available for couriers that actually don't bring it with them or forget it on, on route. So I think a lot of the things that everybody's been talking about in this conversation is about being creative and fixing these problems as they, as they sort of come up in real time. Uh, other questions, uh, is there a way to anticipate, anticipate airlines <laughs> staff strikes or PPE shortages? Again. Not really, no? No. no, no. Okay. Uh, and that is about it for the questions. We have a direct question regarding the flights and what's available. I would say if anybody has questions about what flights are actually actively flying right now, to go ahead and reach out to your agents and the individuals that are sitting on this panel to ask them directly what uh, you need to do for your specific shipment because this information is changing daily and we can provide those updates because we're checking daily as well too. Uh, one other question in case of a follow car van who's driving the vehicle a shipper employer the institution or the rep courier it would be the representative from the uh, agent would most likely be driving that follow car for the individuals. Yeah. So uh, any other things that people want to say? We're getting toward the end of this. It's about uh, 53 minutes in. Uh, I have a couple more questions. Anybody else want to say anything before we wrap up on the questions as well? Oh, go ahead. No, I'm good. Uh, how long in advance do agents expect to require to book a full pallet position? I don't think it was that we're required to book a full pallet position. It's that if you want to make sure your freight is traveling, booking a full pallet position is a better way to guarantee that it moves. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. It also, Jason, it also really depends on your origin and destination and which airline. Um, right. You know, some routes are busier than others. It's, you know, it's, it's not a, a one answer type of thing. It just really depends on the circumstances of particular shipment. Gotcha. The more lead time you give to book, to book that kind of space, the, the better off you'll be. Um, okay. But it's not, just a one-stop answer there. Okay. I think if nobody has anything else to say here, we're going to wrap this up. I want to say thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, we're going to send out the next invite uh, invitation for the uh, following two seminars uh, shortly. So everyone, thank you so much. And to our panelists, thank you all for taking the time to, to speak today. You're welcome. Thanks. You're welcome. Good to Thanks see everybody. Everyone. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.